Hey, good morning, or good day, Fairfax Baptist. Hopefully you're at home right now. Uh, hopefully there's some snow coming down, because that's what they told us was going to happen today, and so we made the decision to uh, not meet in person, uh, but I wanted to be sure I still had an opportunity to come to you and, and open up God's Word and just spend with me, if you would, maybe 20, 25 minutes of your time today. Hopefully you're sitting there with your coffee, looking out at some snow coming down and in your pajamas or whatever and ready to dig in. So if you'll grab your Bibles, if you've got them, and turn to James chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 here in just a minute. You know, again, I, I'm sorry we couldn't meet uh, today. I've really enjoyed getting to be with the congregation each week, and it's hard to believe that we're at the midway point. Um, in fact, of uh, Pastor Joby's sabbatical, and uh, I've really enjoyed the time together. And this past week, I had a chance to give Joby a call. We said we would check in with each other at about the halfway point. And so him and I had a wonderful conversation that he wanted me to kind of relay parts of it on to you. Uh, he, first of all, is doing well, him and his wife, and uh, they are truly enjoying the time. Uh, as you can imagine, he's uh, had to spend some of this time working on his mom's estate uh, because, unfortunately, of her passing. But he's been very grateful and expressed that, of how grateful he is to the church for this time away. He's also been taking some time to study, to reflect, to pray, to do those things that a sabbatical is meant to be about. He, uh, in multiple ways throughout our conversation, expressed his love for you all, the congregation. And I can just tell you as a pastor, I really appreciate that you love your pastor, you care for your pastor. As we've talked about before, it's not always easy. It's not easy to be a leader in any organization because every decision you make, there are people who think it should have been the opposite. And if you've ever been in leadership, you can know and understand and appreciate that. But as a pastor, and we're going to see one of the verses that makes it so today, there's also this kind of a weight of I am accountable to God. Not that we all aren't, but as a pastor, you know you have a flock, you're a shepherd, and you want to be sure that those who are in your care are growing in their faith. I know that's a long answer, but Joby's doing well. He said he looks forward to being back uh, with you that first week in March, and uh, we were just excited about him coming back, rested, reflected, and uh, us as a congregation during this time, not just treading water, but learning some good stuff from James that we can apply and move forward as uh, he gets back. So I'm going to open in a word of prayer, and then we are going to jump right in. God, this morning... On the beauty of this day, and God, hopefully with some snowfall, which we were told was going to be coming, uh, we just want to reflect on you, and maybe in the stillness. And God, as we jump into this passage, open our eyes once again to the reality of the power of our words, and how we have the ability to either build people up or tear them down. And so God, uh, remove me, speak through me. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing I want to do is read the scripture for today, and if you'll allow me, I'm kind of going as high-tech as I'm able to in my basement, but here is the scripture for today. James chapter 3, verse 1, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. 
Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. That is the word of the Lord. And I encourage you to spend some time this week in James chapter 3. Uh, next week I'll be back in person and we'll pick up on the next following verses through the end of that chapter. I hope you also get my midweek kind of devotional. Be sure to open that up. It's just a couple of minutes of a weekly encouragement for you. But today I'm kind of excited because uh, never before have I had, and I'm thinking it's probably going to be never before in the history of Fairfax Baptist, has there been a sermon title that's one word that has been as long as this one. I'll give you a moment to kind of look at it if you're at home as you are playing at home. Uh, see if you can pronounce that out. I've had to work on it a little bit, and I'm not sure I'm going to get it exactly right, but it's Hippopotamonstrous Excal. See, I messed it up. Hippopotamonstrous espidaliophobia. Hippopotamonstrous escapadaliophobia. What a word. It is a real word. It's 36 letters long. As you might have picked up, it's a phobia. It's a fear. But what is it a fear of? Take a look. Now, if you said it's a fear of hippopotamuses, I could see where you could come up with that. But actually... That is the word for a fear of long words, which seems kind of counterintuitive, doesn't it? I mean, if you have a fear of long words, do you want the word that explains that fear to be a long word? It seems like it would make much more sense if that was a one-syllable word, just a couple letters, but it is 36 letters. It's one of the longest words in the dictionary, and it kind of doesn't make sense to me. But maybe it's appropriate, because quite honestly, there's a lot of things that come out of this mouth and maybe out of your mouth that don't make sense. Things we say, things we say haphazardly, things we say quickly, things we say a little bit judgmentally, whatever it might be. And so today we want to focus in on words. And some of you might be going, wait a minute, Pastor, you, you preached this a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? Uh, you would be right in the sense that we talked about being quick to listen and slow to speak. James talks about that in chapter 2, but then he jumps into the issue about works. Remember last week we looked at works and faith and being sure that if we say we're going to be a Christian and be a Christian that we have some works that go along with it to show it. Well, then he jumps back in this section back to words. So what's kind of going on there? Well, actually a lot was going on. As I mentioned before, James is Jesus' brother, and he was the leader of this church in Jerusalem. And he begins to write this letter about how to live your life in a practical, pragmatic way. And the church was under a lot of stress. There was a lot of things going on. And one of the things he really drills on to is the power of our words. Last week I mentioned uh, Martin Luther, who kind of started and did start the Protestant Reformation. And I said, this was a book Martin Luther didn't really like. He really preferred more of some of Paul's works. But one of the things that Martin Luther would definitely agree about with James is the power of our mouth and our tongue. Because Martin Luther said these words, be careful of the tongue. It's in a wet place and liable to slip. Now, before we jump right into those words, there's a verse or two before those that talk about the tongue that I need to touch, and it's that James chapter 3, verse 1, where it said, Not all of you should be teachers, should be teacher or leader, uh, servant in that capacity. i got to tell you, as a teacher, as a leader, as a pastor, that's one of those convicting verses for me. Why did James put that? Well, again, the church at the time was comprised of a lot of new Christians, come in and learning about Jesus, and now they, they had a setting where they could kind of come together, and before you knew it, there was a little bit of chaos going on within the church. Uh, people were seeing that being a teacher, I could get up and kind of spout whatever I want. I could talk about this and this and kind of cater it to what I wanted. I could manipulate what some of Jesus was saying. And so James comes and says, you know, that should not be, and in fact, the 
church was beginning to get comprised of a lot of people when that started to happen to create more chaos and there was things like gossip and stuff going on and in James chapter 4 which we'll get to in a couple weeks James gives this reminder what causes these fights and quarrels among you don't they come from your desires that battle within you and then he also said in 411 brothers and sisters do not slander one another there was a lot of chaos going on within that church now, some of us go, you know, there should never be any conflict within a church. But if you've ever been in a church with conflict, you know it's very uncomfortable. But the reality is there is conflict in any organization, whether it's your homeowners association, whether it's where you work, whether it's at your gym. You get a group of people together, there's going to be some issues. But what was happening in the church in Jerusalem that James is addressing is people were starting to gossip. People were starting to judge. People were starting to slander one another. And James says, we've got to put, you know, a stop to this. It needs to start with leadership. And so if you are a leader, you need to consider what you say, what you do, and how you present yourself. The second verse, though, in chapter 3 is one that I love, <laughs> one that I actually use quite a bit. I actually use it a lot in marriage counseling, believe it or not, because I think it speaks to the whole reason there's sometimes conflict. Not only in a marriage or in an organization, but in a church. It says this, we all stumble in many ways. Now, who is that? All of us. We all stumble. When I talk with couples in pre-marriage counseling, I'll say, you know, you got the, the husband, and guess what? You stumble. And you're going to marry your beautiful wife, and she's beautiful and wonderful, but guess what? She stumbles. And so you come together, and of course there's going to be some issues and some problems. And you're going to have these little people, eventually children, these little people, but you know what those little people do? They stumble. And so we have all of this because of sin that kind of creates this stress within the relationships that we have. And it's the same, again, within organizations and within churches. And so James kind of starts off kind of laying that framework right before he jumps in to the power of our words. The first slide I showed was a long word. Now I want to show a big number. 860,341,500. Take a guess what that number is. That's the amount of words you will most likely say over the course of your life. And God says, we're accountable for all of them. 860 million words. Now, some of you probably will say a little bit more, and some of you quiet people will say a little bit less. But on average, we're told that we speak about 16,000 words a day. And when you think about that, it reminds me that we, you, are an extremely powerful person. You may go, I'm not powerful. I, I just have a, a regular job in the government, or I'm just a stay-at-home mom, or I'm just a kid. I'm just a teenager. I'm not powerful. No, your words are powerful. The things you say to someone, whether you build them up or tear them down, is powerful. How do I know that? Because if you're an adult, I can guarantee there are some things if you look back as a teenager, as a child, Someone in influence said to you or about you that still sticks to this day. Maybe you still have an insecurity about your looks or your weight or your, your intelligence or something else because of some words that were said to you 20, 30, 40 years ago. Let me tell you how powerful our words are. They don't have to be a lot of words. If there's a defendant in front of a judge and the judge says this word, guilty, one word, but all the weight that that word carries with it. Or again, when a couple comes together to get married and they stand across from each other and they say just two words, I do. The covenant and the commitment that is made there that will last a lifetime, those two words are so powerful. If you're at a doctor's office and the doctor comes in and says, good news, 
your cancer free. Those three words will change your life. If a president says, we're going to war, the implications of that on people's lives and livelihoods is insurmountable. It's huge. And if you've ever said the words that can truly change your life, and not only your life here, but throughout eternity, I will follow Jesus. It shows how powerful our words are. But I want you to know, as I kind of said before, words are not equally weighted. It's not that for every negative word, I just need a positive word and they kind of cancel each other out. No, you know, you can hear hundreds of compliments. And then you hear something negative, a criticism, and you hold on to that. If you've ever watched a video online or read a blog or something like that, you can see a lot of positive comments, but then somewhere along there is going to be a negative one, and boy, that's the thread that then people seize on, and it's negativity over negativity over negativity. Because what we say, it breathes that same type of energy back to us. Not only are words not weighted, but who says them is not weighted the same. If you're a boss, if you're a leader, if you're a person of influence, your words weigh a lot. They, they weigh like 100 pounds. If you're a mom, and you say something, you weigh like 500 pounds. And for whatever reason, if you're a dad, your words, they kind of weigh the most. I've dealt with a lot of people who are still carrying around the baggage of things their dad said in the moment as they were growing up. And so, men, we have to be careful of the words that we say and how we say them and the tone in which we say them. Because that scripture goes on to say, your words, they affect the whole body, which is so true. Because you think about it, when your kids talk back to you or something, you don't just send their mouth or their tongue into timeout, you send the whole body. If you get an argument with your boss, they don't just fire your tongue or your mouth, they're going to fire the whole person. And again, if you say something uh, insensitive or, or kind of bad to your wife, it's not just your mouth or your tongue that goes and sleeps on the couch. It's the whole body. And so James kind of alludes to all of these things, and we would be reminded that even Jesus spoke about the power of our words when he said to the religious leaders at the time in Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers. That's some strong words. He said, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Like I said, if I hang around you and I see how you act, how you work, your faith, the things you do, it's going to tell me what you believe. But it also appears very clear that out of the mouth speaks the heart. If you hang around someone and they're talking about money all the time and they're talking about possessions, you know what they're thinking about all the time? That. If you hang around someone and they're talking about sex all the time and they're talking about very derogatory things, you know what they're thinking about all the time? That perverse stuff. If you hang around someone and they're talking about their family and their love for their spouse and their kids, you know what's important to them? Their family. And so when people hang around you, those 16,000 words you say a day, those 860 million over the course of your life, what would the people around you say is important to you? I mean, if you were on trial, if I was on trial, and there was a jury there, and the case had to be made that you were a believer in Jesus, would your words reflect that? Is there enough positive words about Jesus and towards other people that would convict you of being a Christian? James goes on. As I mentioned, he has six illustrations, as any good preacher would have. He talks about how the tongue is a bit like in a horse's mouth. It's like a consuming fire. It's like a rudder on a ship. It's like poison. It's like a fountain. It's like a fig tree. I know you're enjoying some time at home, and you're hopefully already on that second cup of coffee, so I'm not going to elongate this too much for you. So I just wanted to focus on two of them. The first is that bit in a horse's mouth. My daughter, Brianna, who just turned 17, when she was like eight, nine years old, we decided to put her in some horseback riding lessons. And I remember the first time going to the, to the stables, I hadn't been around horses much and quickly realized that that's a huge animal. That's a powerful animal. That animal can, can literally pull a, a car. 
and my 70 to 80 pound year old, eight, nine year old is gonna get close to that animal. But you know what happened? Her instructor put her on and we went through the first lesson, it was great, and a couple more, and came back a couple of lessons later and I saw a picture similar to this. There's my daughter, 70, 80 pounds, on top of this huge animal of several thousand pounds. And she was holding these reins and within those reins was that bit in the mouth, that small little piece. But if she pulled to the right on that rein, that horse would go to the right. If she pulled to the left, that 70, 80 pound girl could move the whole thing, that whole horse, to the left. James is saying, you know, this tongue is small. And I looked it up, the tongue is like between four and six inches long. It's pretty small. There's eight muscles in the tongue, and I've mentioned it before. Of all the muscles in your body, your biceps will wear out, your heart will wear out, your, your lungs, you know, all the muscles in your body wear out and they get tired except for the tongue. And so we've got to be careful what comes out of it. The second illustration that James speaks about that I think is very prevalent is that of a fire. You ever have trouble with these things? There you go. He says, you know, kind of like a, a spark can start a forest fire. Now, you and I have seen this in real time. We've seen news stories of acres and acres, thousands, set ablaze, all because of something that small. I mean, it's improportional, right? This little thing here that I can easily control, if left uncontrolled, can do this. And whether intentional or accidental, if I'm not careful with this, I could cause that. Again, with our mouths. Whether intentional or accidental, whether we're lazy in how we speak or whether we meant it, if we're not careful with what we say, we can kind of bring a scorched earth to the people around us. And some of you, unfortunately, and and I, in certain areas of my life, have dealt with that. Kind of a scorched earth. People have said things and hurt me. And, you know, for them, they've said things like, I just had to get it out. Well, I, I'm just, that's the way I am. I, I just say what I feel. I can't help it. I'm, I'm Italian. I'm Irish. I'm this. I just, I'm at a certain age. I'm just going to let you know. Yeah. That's not biblical. I mean, the collateral damage and the damage that you do is insurmountable. It's like a fire that's let loose. There's a quote that says, as your words go, so goes your entire life. You can burn down your career, you could burn down your family, you can burn down your future. And so today, I just want us to consider that there's a couple of things we need to be sure about. You see, James, as he goes through this, he says, you know, other things we've tamed, animals we've tamed, and uh, creatures and things like that, but no one can tame the tongue. And, and as a pastor, where I want to give you an application and go, so here it is, here's the three things you got to do, and you'll never, ever say anything wrong. You'll never, ever slip up. You'll never, ever say anything volatile, but that's not the case. It's something we've got to be on top of each and every day. Because James doesn't give us any hope, no suggestions. He's, you are never safe to relax your thinking about your words. So what do we do? Well, first, I think we need to surrender our tongues and our words to the Lord. I don't know if you've picked up on this yet, but I'm pretty pragmatic. I like stuff that's practical. And you know, our bodies are considered a temple to the Lord. And so I do this, and I would encourage you to do this. When you brush your teeth in the morning and in the evening, it's a great time as you're cleaning your mouth and maybe even brushing your tongue to say a little prayer. God, I surrender this tongue to you. I surrender my words. I want to speak truth. I want to speak love. I want to speak life. I want to speak positivity in all that I do. I think it's important so that we can remember the importance of the words that we say. Secondly, when you make a mistake, and you're going to make one, you may make one before this video has been over with something you say. Be sure you confess. Not only surrender your tongue, but confess. And I don't mean one of those apologies that goes, if you were hurt by 
something I said, or if you took something I said the wrong way, no, that's not an apology. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Be sure that you fix those things when we say things that are incorrect. Moms, Dad, I mentioned the power of your words. Well, kids, children, and if you're watching this, you know what? You're a child. You're somebody's child, whether they're living or not living, whether you're uh, uh, underage or whether you're older, you're someone's child. Let me tell you something, and all of you parents know this. Nothing strikes harder to the heart than the words of our children. So be cautious what you say. It's not just, oh, it's mom. Oh, it's dad. You can say whatever. No, those words from your kids, believe me, they cut right to your heart. You know, there are people that I've kind of qualified as either polluters or purifiers. I mean, think about it. You've seen pollution. You've seen pictures. You've seen a, a smokestack. You, you've been around people that you get around them. They're just like a polluter. They're just negative. And it kind of like they breed negativity. And people are negative or kind of around them. But you know you get around them and you just feel drained. You just want to get away. I don't ever want to be like that. There are other people in life that are purifiers. You know, when COVID happened and even now, everybody's scrambling to find better air purifiers for your heating air conditioning systems. Because a purifier, what's it do? It takes what's in the air and makes it even cleaner. It takes out the bad stuff. Don't be a polluter, be a purifier. Be a person that when you hit the room, they see you and they want to gravitate to you because they know you got a great energy. You got a great outlook. You got some great positivity. I'm not saying don't be realistic. Yeah, there's hard things, there's hard stuff in the world. But I promise you, if you speak words of love, words of grace, words of positivity, you will see the world through those lenses rather than on the opposite. I have four questions that I would ask that you consider about when you speak. Because so often I think we just say too, well, we're called to speak the truth in love. And sometimes we err on one side or the other. There's people who just speak love and they don't want to ever have a conflict, ever have confrontation. But there's other people, again, who say, I just speak the truth. I'm just going to tell them the way it is. I think there's more to it. One, is it true? Is what you're going to say, maybe even in a hard conversation, is it true? Secondly, is it loving? Do you really care about the other person? Are you saying it in a way that is going to help them grow? Three, kind of leads into that, is it helpful? You know, there's some things that are true and some things that are known, but you know what? The person doesn't need to know about them. You know, as an associate pastor of a lot of churches with a senior pastor, I would hear things from church members, and sometimes they were complaints, and sometimes they were important and valid, and I would pass it on to the senior pastor because I thought they needed to know. But lots of times the person just needed to vent a little, and it wasn't going to be helpful for me to go tell the pastor. And so, you know, if someone's coming to you and go, oh, I don't like this about the church, or I don't like this about this person, or whatever, first, if it's gossip, you need to call them on it. Secondly, if it's a real issue, you need to say, you know what, I'll go with you, and we'll go sit down and talk about that. Or you can do Matthew 18, you need to go and talk to that person, because that's what's biblical. So is it helpful? And I would also say, is the timing right? You know, sometimes... You need to say something, but the timing isn't right. You don't want to get into one of those deep conversations right before you go to bed. I mean, gosh, you might be up all night on something and you're tired. Likewise, sometimes when we receive communications, and whether it's through email or social media or whatever, people are so quick to respond. That first, we need to ask ourselves, do I need to send this email? Is the timing right on that? Is it the appropriate time? Because an email or a post or whatever, it can be so one-sided. I can just go, blah, kind of puke it all out on you. And you can't do anything, but you got to read it. Rather than to pick up the phone and have a good old-fashioned conversation. Yeah, I need to take a moment in closing just to brag on my wife. Because she's a purifier. And I wanted to tell you about the power of a conversation and of words. Sometimes you never know the power of your words until way on beyond. 
So in my ministry, I've had a great opportunity to go over to some countries in Central Asia and then uh, the Middle East. I can't name the countries because they're considered closed countries. To be a Christian there is a criminal offense, and so I can't mention the countries. But I will say I went to a country which was considered an open country. And one of the neighboring countries there, which was a closed country, there were some believers with house churches, and sometimes those house churches only had two or three people. And anyway, about 30 different leaders snuck out of the country and came over to this other country where we met them in an undisclosed location. And for a week, we went through God's Word and kind of poured into them. And I heard stories about how they were imprisoned for their faith, how they would take their Bible in this particular country and, and put it under a potted plant so if the authorities came in, they wouldn't know that they were believers. They couldn't even sing because if they did, maybe a neighbor would hear and report them. Well, anyway, while there, these stories were amazing, and we met a young girl, and I'm going to call her Natalie. And Natalie was just wonderful, and her dream was to come to the United States. And anyway, she eventually made her way to the United States, but her way of getting here and her experience here was extremely tough, and some things happened to her that were unfortunate. And on one particular night when she decided to move from New York to the D.C. area, she ended up living with a friend of mine. And we got a phone call, and Natalie was in a bad place that night. She was ready to take her life. And we went over, and we talked with her, and we had a great conversation, kind of kept up with her, but lost touch. And actually, it had been about five years since we'd actually heard from her at all. And we prayed for her, my wife and I. But on Thanksgiving this past year, Thanksgiving 2020, when we were thinking about what to be thankful for, as we're sitting around the table, COVID, all the stuff of the year, my phone dings, and I open it up, and there's a message from Natalie. And I won't read the whole thing. It's a lot longer than this, but I did want to begin to pick up on this. I want you to hear the power of words. She says, I moved to the U.S. in 2013 after I graduated dental school for a better life to live in a free world without the fear of being a woman or being in prison for what I believe. I came to America to follow my dream, knowing this country would give me the opportunity when my own country closed its doors to me. I didn't know at that time that my journey was going to be so eventful. I had hard days, but through all those times, God brought angels my way who supported me and who pushed me to go forward. You and your wife, that's my wife Tony, were two of those people. Again, I don't know if you remember, but I will never forget that day. And to be honest, we'll never forget that day. I had an emotional breakdown while I was living with your friend, and I could not bear living on my own, and all I wanted to do was give up and go back home. I was so broken so badly that I wanted to take my own life. That day, you and your wife, you showed up, and you revived me and gave me hope. And Tony, my wife, talked to me exactly, in capital letters, how my mom would talk to me and gave me strength to continue. I remember Tony's exact words she told me. Why did you come here to the U.S.? I told her to become a dentist, and Tony said, then you can't give up and go until you become a dentist. Today, on Thanksgiving Day, I am writing this to you and Tony because on Monday, I received the best news of my life. I got admitted into one of the best dental schools in the country. Can you imagine how, well, I'll tell you, I, I was in tears. Reading that at Thanksgiving, this past Thanksgiving. You never know the power of your words. You never know the power of the conversation you may have today of how it's going to shape someone's life. And we may never even hear about it till the other side of eternity. But today, friends, I just want to encourage you. Be quick to listen, slow to speak. Speak the truth in love. Speak it when it's helpful, and speak it when the timing is right. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Have a great day.